um, in the last two and three hundred years. Um, I, I know we have been involved in like uh, mission work, like short-term mission, long-term missions. We have been supporting missionaries. But I think that the kind of what you, when you think about uh, missions, I, I, I get a sense when I talk to uh, different people, it's like kind of a piece here, a piece there. So I, I want to kind of give you a, a, like a little historical outline of how modern mission history looks like. For example, how did the movement start? Who were the key players? Uh, just want to fill some knowledge gaps since like, I had to kind of quickly put together this uh, message. And when I think about the history of modern missions, uh, a few key theme, themes come to my mind first. The first theme is Baptist. Now we're Baptist. Now although the Baptist movement has only started like about 500 years ago, uh, it played a very powerful role in worldwide mission in the last 200 years. Um, and much has to do with what we call the founder of modern missions, uh, Pastor William Carey, um, and he, he was a Baptist. The second theme I can think of is women. Uh, women have played a key role in the history of missions. Uh, women were wives who went with their mis uh, missionary husband. Mis um, some, sometimes single women went as a missions, uh, missionaries themselves. Um, in fact, among missionaries who were single, there were more women than men. Um, and also we have like women's organizing, uh, fundraising in the homeland to support mission work. So the, the role of women is significant. Now the third idea I can think of, the third theme would be education. Um, establishing schools, uh, orphanage, and educational system in the mission field had been uh, one of the key things that modern missionaries do. Um, they understand that until mission is um, uh, it's done with, with education, it's not going to be very deep. Now you can tell people about, uh, about Jesus, but if they cannot even read, if they cannot even read the Bible for themselves, there's only so much you can tell. So that's why education, curing illiteracy, is such an important thing. So I want to give you keep these three words in your mind as you think about modern mission history, Baptist, women, and education. Now, um, because we had to make room for uh, Pastor Tong Lee Lee to come today, uh, we kind of skipped a, a, a message in our sermon series, like, uh, unlike other cross-point campuses. And uh, that, that uh, particular sermon has to do with Luke chapter 2. But I do think that when I, when I look at chapter 2 again, there are some related issues in that passage. So I want to read like just a few words from there um, with you. And... Um, First, uh, it was about an old guy, like, you know, Joseph and uh, uh, Mary, they uh, brought uh, Jesus to the temple to offer him as uh, it's in customary in Jewish tradition, and they met Simon, uh, Simeon, the old guy there. Um, and uh, and uh, Simeon uh, prayed to God and said, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal, God's to, the, to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. So he had been waiting in the temple for the arrival of the Messiah, and he knew that this Messiah is not just to bring salvation to the Israel, but to all people. Then Simeon said to uh, Mary, this child is destined to cause many Israel, many in Israel to fall, and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thought of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. That's what he told Mary, mother of Jesus. Now you think about what, what the, how does that fit in the picture? I think if we can call Jesus as a missionary, then Simeon was commissioning not so much the, the, the missionary, but the parents of the missionaries. He was basically t teaching Joseph and Mary how to raise this kid to be the missionary that he is. Um, and uh, I think it is very important, some of us here are parents, uh, as we, um, as we um, look at the, the history, like all these people became missionaries very young. How did it become possible? Well, one of the reasons is with the support of the parents. Now, um, but more importantly, what is mission? What is, what, what, what is the Great Commission? One way to look at it is missionaries 
bring light to the world. Now, Christmas is all about light. You see light bulb, you see beautiful lighting. But missionaries, they bring light to the world. They bring light to the hearts of men and women so that what happened? The hidden thoughts, the darkness in the heart got revealed. Now, that is true for everyone. All of us have some, like, you know, darkness in our own heart. The question is, what do you do with it when it is exposed? Everyone has a decision to make. Stay in the darkness, hide in the, in the shadow, or turn to the light. And that is the decision we make. And I want to highlight, this is a very um, particularly Baptistic theme, because as Baptists we believe that salvation is our own. Each one has to deal with this problem of sin ourselves, and each of us has to respond and make a decision. So that is very Baptistic if you look at it. So you see there's three themes, Baptist, women, and education, even in this particular passage. Now, it, it turns out that even though the idea of a mission um, is now very much characteristics of our Baptist denomination, it wasn't always the case. In fact, if you go back in history, even though Baptists have existed for 400, 500 years, it came to become a dominant theme of our life only in the last 200 years. Um, in the first two, 300 years of the, after the Reformation, most of the mission work, worldwide mission work were done by the Roman Catholics. Um, they were the people who sent missionaries all over the world. Um, people, um, especially in, in, ter in, in, uh, in kingdoms, Spain, Portugal, and France, they sponsor a lot of Catholic missions into the, to the Far East, to Central America, and South America. Now, how about the Protestant? Now, although the Protestant, like as Puritans, have been um, reaching out in a way uh, <coughs> to the Native Americans uh, back in even in the, in the, in the 17th century, uh, it wasn't really a thing. When, when people talk about mission uh, in the Protestant world, it was mostly just preaching to neighbors, uh, evangelizing. Um, in 1701, uh, there was an organization called the Society of the Propagation of the Gospel um, created by the Anglican Church. Um, it was done for foreign mission, but in, in the sense that they were sending Anglican pastors from England over to here, to, to the state, uh, not the state, to, 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 to North America especially, um, to outreach to people here. Um, and then only after a while, did it, the, even the, um, the, the, the Native American became their target. Now, in, in, uh, in Europe, continental Europe, um, there was some work too. King Frederick uh, the Fourth of Denmark was one of the few Protestant king who believed strongly in mission work in 1706. He uh, sent a bunch of uh, Lutheran priests um, to, to bring the gospel to India. And I think if you go back before 200 years ago, um, the most important group that we, we read is called the Moravians, or the Moravian Brothers. And they had a particular leader um, named Sinzendorf, uh, or sometimes they call, uh, the, the full name that they have, very, very long name, Kang Nicholas Ludwig von Sinzendorf, right? So, but usually we just call him Sinzendorf. Um, and they were um, very into a spiritual pursuit. They were very pietistic. So they, um, they, would go, they, they would focus on evangelism among their own people. The interesting thing about the, the Moravians and uh, um, under the leadership of Sinzendorf is the way they do mission is they go as a group. So instead of just like a lot today when we think about missionaries, we think of like we send a couple there to do mission work. They actually went to, they move over there. So like eight or 10 families will migrate together, almost like, like a little like a, a village. They would move to a village and then they would move together, eight, 10 families, move to a place and then settle there and then like, you know, bring the gospel to their neighbors. So that's the way they work. And, um, and initially, they were mostly in uh, German-speaking territory, but they spread out to Greenland, to the West Indies, to South Af Africa. Now, so, but the, the key figure that you should remember when, you, when we think about modern uh, mission history, the first one to came, uh, that you, you should think about is William Carey. And we think of him as the father of modern Protestant missionary movement. 
he was originally a shoemaker. Um, uh, he dropped out of school at the age of 12 um, and, uh, and kind of like a self-made man. Um, he, but he, he has a gift in language. He actually taught himself Greek and Hebrew. Uh, by 1792, he was good enough. They actually, even though he didn't go to theological school, didn't re even fit get a high school diploma, they actually allowed him to preach a, a, in a Baptist church. Um, but his interest is not just in la learning language or teaching the Bible. He is interested in mission. He wrote a very famous book. Uh, they, they back in those days, they have very long book title. It's called An Angry into the Obligations of Christians to Use Means for the Conversions of the Heathens. Okay, do you see the name? Yes. Okay, so they like to write the, the name of the book to those you know exactly what they want to talk about. It's before you buy the book, okay, this is what I'm going to talk about. Now, why would he talk about that? Um, he belonged to a, uh, a branch of uh, the Baptist movement in those days called Particular Baptist. And the Particular Baptists are hyper-Calvinists. Uh, they, 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 they believe that if God wants something to happen, God would make that happen. We don't need to do much. If we do much, we are not like, respecting God's work. Uh, William Carey said, like, uh, not really, right? I mean, even though God is working, we could also participate. And that's why he, what he means by use means. We can, like, we can go there and talk to people. That's use means. So it's not just like um, God doing. We can be doing something too. Now, interestingly, when we talk about the Great Commissions today, we, for example, we talk about Matthew 28, even um, people even read the Great Commission differently back in those days. Uh, one of uh, the common thing people do is they would read it like it was something that was already done in the early church. So they would think of the Great Commission as something that the early church has already done and that they finish it. Now the, the, the gospel has spread throughout all the earth. So it's a done deal. So now we just focus on reaching out to our neighborhoods. Um, even the way they read, uh, the focus is not so much goal. When people read Matthew 28 back in those days, what they read is a proof text for baptizing someone in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So it's a proof text for what? Trinity. So that, like, one day when we, like, you know, for example, you heard Pastor Lerm talk about Matthew 20 almost every other week, right? So we think of it as making disciples, Great Commission. But that particular text was even looked at differently. Now, um, he looked at it this way. He think of it as, this is, yes, we, we've done it, but every generation must still do it over again. He looked at a particular um, line in the, in the book of Haggai, Haggai, and that, that was line, the glory of the later shall be the greater than the former. So even though Great Commission was done in the early church, later, when we do it again, it will be even more glorious. And so and he, like a lot of the people in those days, believed that the knowledge of God will fill the earth before our Lord Jesus return. And he was influenced by a famous American theologian named Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards, a uh, uh, minister in Massachusetts, um, in Northampton, um, and uh, he started a prayer movement to call people to pray seriously about spreading the gospel and returning to the Lord. Um, they were primarily ministering to Native Americans. Uh, in fact, his almost son-in-law was uh, died while ministering to uh, the Native Indians. Um, Carey himself, in a sermon he preached to his uh, brothers in the, um, the Baptist denomination in Northampton, uh, no, sorry, Northampton is in Massachusetts, Nottingham, Nottingham in England, uh, called them to uh, form an association to take the gospel to all over the world. And uh, he famously declared, expect great things, attempt great things. Uh, that's the line that is attributed to him all the time. And then through his effort, they established a, the first Baptist Missionary Society, BMS, in UK. Um, in, interesting the way they do it. They, uh, like they don't form a 501c3 like, like us, like a nonprofit. They actually make it a trading company. Like if you make it a trading company, you have the excuse to trade goods to all of the world. So sort of like uh, they, they have the big East Indian company. So uh, if you want to support 
uh, Mission World, you actually become a shareholder of this trading company so that they can do business. And uh, when they do business, um, you can do Mission World on the side. But uh, he was sent to India in 1793. Um, he settled in a place called Samapur. Samapur is actually near Calcutta. Um, and uh, in 1799, he began the groundwork to do long-term missions. Um, and he has two colleagues, uh, one named William Ward, the other named Joshua Marshman. Um, so the three of them, the, the, the Sarampore Trio, uh, sometimes they call, um, would work hands uh, together. It actually took him seven years, William Carey, to uh, get the first convert uh, named Krishna Pau. Uh, and then in uh, 1800, um, he was, um, Krishna was baptized. Uh, Carey put it this way, I am very glad to be able to desecrate the Ganges and baptize the first Indian. Why would they say desecrate? Well, because the Indian believed the Ganges River was actually a god. <laughs> so he wanted to desecrate the river Ganges uh, by baptizing someone in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit there. So that's like kind of a mockery, but you know, it's kind of making fun of the situation. Um, and, but after that, more and more Indians received baptism and meeting places were set up in uh, uh, cities and then they have outreach uh, outposts in uh, the villages. Um, they thought of literature as a uh, priority. A lot of the people um, don't read, uh, they, they're illiterate. I mean, actually still today, I mean, unfortunately, even if you go to India, a lot of people are still illiterate. Um, but if you are illiterate, you cannot read the Bible, you cannot believe. But in addition to uh, literacy, education, the, the focus is, well, we should understand the language first. Um, Carey translated the New Testament into Bengali as early as 1796. Um, during his lifetime, he translated the Bible into six Indian dialects. There are actually more than 5,000 uh, Indian dialects. But uh, he at least did that part of it uh, tr into 29 dialects. And they did print a lot of booklets. And uh, um, the interesting thing is they also find out that there is a market for uh, selling uh, Hindu scripture in England because people in England was curious about this, like, you know, this, this Hindu religion. So they would actually do the opposite. They would translate some Hindu scripture and into English and sell it in UK to fund the mission work, uh, all the while allowing themselves to learn a little bit about the Hindu world, world Hindu religion. Um, and uh, they also published magazines. Uh, one of the periodicals they uh, produced was called The Friend of India. And they, t they tell people about what is it like in India. People subscribe to it and they make a few dimes. Uh, uh, pen, no, actually, pounds. <laughs> uh, and uh, they were um, involved also in uh, developing the Indian society, um, helping to uh, change the culture. Now, one of the things they, they, they push and successfully push was to ban the evil practice of sati. Now, what is sati? Um, it was the practice of burning widows alive when the husband died. So they, there was like when when you were when your husband died uh, and you are widow, like you became a burden to society. So the honorable thing to do, like in the traditional uh, some Hindu uh, tribes, is you burn yourself alive with your husband at his funeral. And it is such like, you know, barbaric and in inhumane. So they managed to convince the government to ban that practice. Um, and uh, he has an interest in the natural conversation, uh, conser conservation too. So um, he, for example, William Carey would collect a lot of specimens of Indian plants himself and, uh, um, and uh, try to uh, preserve uh, uh, useful scientific information for people to look at the Indian subcontinent. And uh, um, what happened is like it, he, his work got a lot of interest in the US. So there's a Phila Philadelphia Baptist Association, uh, raised a lot of money for them. Um, also up in New England, uh, the Baptist and the Congregationalists, um, especially the women, they got so interested in the mission in India, they formed something called the Boston Female Society for Missionary Purpose. And those are usually moms and uh, stay-at-home um, women who uh, uh, would uh, raise money, uh, well, 
uh, usually those in those days women don't make money; they just talk to their husband, but you know, or their father. But uh, um, they they raise money uh, for for the for the missionaries doing work, um, and that uh, became the beginning of uh, something like today. We we still have WMU Women Missionary Women Missionary Union, so a lot of the women were involved back home in uh, uh, and organizing and fundraising. Um, one of the first missionaries that was supported by um, the, um, the Foreign Mission Board uh, created in New England, his name was Adoniram Judson. Now he was originally a Congregationalist. Now Congregationalists and Baptists are different in one way in that they believe in infant baptism, but they are pol politically very similar to Baptists, they vote, right? Um, and uh, he, but he attended a what is now called a Brown, a Brown University, which is a, which is a Baptist founded institute. So he had exposure to both sides, uh, um, and he became a missionary as a Congregationalist on his way to India. While he was riding on a boat, he thought, "Oh, I'm going to meet William Carey, a Baptist." So he thought, mm, "I need, I better need to kind of like think about this issue: infant baptism versus believer baptism." And he and his wife came to the conclusion that, well, really, the Baptists are right. Uh, we shouldn't really uh, baptize infants. So he, he, after he landed, uh, he became a Baptist. He was actually uh, baptized by one of the, um, the, um, the, the co colleagues of uh, William Carey, um, William Ward. Um, but he, he, now that he changed him, he had to like, kind of like go back home because he was supported by a congregational mission board. So he, he went home. Like what? And that, okay, what? Like that, that wasn't a Baptist uh, mission board back in the U.S. quite yet. Uh, not U.S. I mean North America quite yet. So what happened? Well, he it, interestingly he has a classmate. His name uh, Luther Rice, and he was also a Congregationalist. He also went to India, but his uh, health condition is not good enough for um, the tough uh, climate in India. So he decided to come home, and then instead of going out to mission work. He decided, well, well, like I cannot go, but my friends like at all time just can go. How about I do some organization and fundraising work for him? So Luther Rice actually became a most important figure in the early Baptist life because he organized something called a Missionary General Conference, um, a triannual conference, meaning that it means uh, every three years, starting in 1814. And that is the predecessor of denominations. Because uh, Baptist denominations, because Baptists were kind of always loosely uh, uh, organized or independent and autonomous. They, they don't get together. But because of mission work, they meet once every three years. And then later on, they meet more, more often. And that's why, like, you know, our denomination is called the Southern Baptist Convention. It's not a church, it's a Southern Baptist Convention. Why? Because the denomination only meets like three days a week, basically. Um, and the rest of the time, they, they is, uh, it is not in business, right? They call it not in session. So that is the beginning of the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, talk a little bit about, about Adoniram Judson. Um, he actually established a ministry is a little bit lower, like smaller scale, because unlike India, he was ministering in Burma. Um, he was focusing more on personal work, like just converting people, had some success. Uh, didn't have a printing press like uh, uh, William Carey, so he got uh, printed in India, sent over to Burma, and then passed them out. Um, but he did focus a lot on translating the Bible himself, and by 1836, he managed to translate the entire Bible into Burmese. Um, and his wife also uh, did some translation. Uh, her, her wife did the first Thai translation in 1819, um, the couple became role models for a lot of young missionaries or aspiring missionaries, especially in, the, in, in America. Uh, when they, a lot of kids, when they grow up, they dream to become kind of like the, uh, the Anne and the Adonai Justin, go out to the mission field and serve the Lord. Um, and that is that uh, actually they had the stories kind of become sort of a romantic, um, probably too romantic. Um, story for a lot of young missionaries, but it does help to drive the missionary movement. But part of this interesting observation is women, through their, um, their kind of going together as couple, uh, became a great um, 
asset in the mission movement. Unlike uh, the, the Roman Catholics who go as priests mostly uh, and later on as nuns, um, Protestant missionary, especially this Baptist mission, they go as a family. They go as a couple first and then they might become a family. And it, it, it changed the, the shape. I mean, instead of like thinking about an individual representing an organization, it's a family that go. You go as a family unit. You live life among people so that people can look at your life and look at what's so different about Christian life. And that, that is an asset, uh, unlike the Roman Catholics. Um, by the middle of the 19th century, um, the idea of sending single women became even more uh, acceptable. Um, and then initially, the Foreign Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention uh, tried to send someone called Harriet Baker to China in 1847. It wasn't successful. But um, in 1866, um, there, there was a very famous book published by uh, someone called Marianne Lewis, who, uh, who has a title, uh, interesting title, Plea for St. Nanas. Now, what is St. Nanas? Um, it is the place where uh, single women live, but you have to have a high caste single woman. So she believes that there is a way in into the Indian society and it's by talking to young ladies, like, you know, high caste young ladies. But in order to get into those rooms, in order to get into those high caste young ladies, they need young ladies themselves. So he was, she was asking for young ladies from, uh, from, 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 from the West to go to the foreign missionary focusing, focusing on uh, uh, young ladies, uh, teenage girls like, like you guys. Um, and, then, um, and that was like why they, were like they, they asked for a lot of single women to start going to a mission field. Um, and they, um, for example, there was an organization um, who, uh, uh, we, we talked about actually earlier, the Boston Missionary Society, right? They were focusing a lot on uh, recruiting single women to serve in the mission field, initially to target the young girls, but generally speaking, they also do other works. Um, in fact, by the late 19th century, uh, unmarried women made up a growing proportion of the worldwide mission force. Uh, and then we uh, have figures like Lottie Moon. Uh, and this uh, giving, the Christmas giving that we have been kind of planning is out of her. She actually uh, um, grew up in Virginia. And uh, um, she was such an effective person. Uh, uh, and uh, they managed to uh, send her to China as a missionary. Uh, and uh, she actually uh, write it back home and say, wow, you guys can do run fundraising. So he ca she came up with this idea. How about we go to churches and ask them to, like, you know, collect a special Christmas offering every year around Christmas time when people would like to bring gifts. And then, so that became a tradition in the uh, Baptist world. Uh, and, uh, but of course it was not called the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. That we became the Chris, uh, Lottie Moon Christmas uh, mission offering in 1918, six years after she passed away. And I, I read somewhere today, uh, somewhere, that over the years, accumulatively, they, they raised at least five billion uh, in Lottie Moons. Um, but the involvement of women uh, was so strong, by 1910, 55% of missionaries sent by denominational agency in the United States were actually women. Uh, so there were actually more women in the mission field than men. Well, it, it kind of makes sense, right? Like you have couples, you have one man, one woman, but th you have some single women, so you actually have a little bit more. Um, a lot of the women were involved in education. Um, education was prioritized from the beginning because uh, they want to allow the native Christians to become leaders. So they become evangelists, they can multiply. Um, and uh, you, in uh, near where William Carey uh, minister, by 1818, they had 92 schools, about 10,000 students. So a lot of people want to come to Christian school to learn, not just here, even back in those days. Um, and uh, also, um, they start even colleges uh, uh, and uh, universities. Um, so that is why the, the missionaries were always very powerful in bringing higher education 
to uh, the mission field. Um, later on, they even had a trade school. What they found out was, well, in, in addition to teaching them grammar and basic uh, math, they could also teach them practical skill, uh, like you know, engineering, business, medicine. Um, what, and then it, it becomes an interesting idea in and of itself because then how, how we're going to have people who teach them engineering, business, and medicine? Well, you need to have people with that experience um, and like not a lot of pastors have that experience. So they, became, they, they began to recruit what? Engineers, businessmen, and uh, uh, like medical doctors into the mission field. And that changed the, the shape of the missionary movement from purely like a religious and cultural kind of thing into a more practical thing. A lot of the people who are lay leaders uh, of the church, uh, originally deacons, they go out and do work uh, as laymen, they, they call it. Um, and then universities, a lot of them start. Um, now, one final figure before we end, I want to kind of like, you know, so we talk about William Carey, we talk about Adoniram Justin, we talk about Lord Timwood. One additional person that I, I, I want to mention was named Henrietta Schuck. Now, Henrietta uh, was um, born Henrietta Hall uh, in Virginia uh, in 1817. Uh, she was baptized when she was 14, like a lot of you. Um, and then two months later, unfortunately, her mother died and she went to a boarding school. Um, and then um, there she began um, not just to study, but to teach uh, Sunday school, children's Sunday school. And uh, in when she was 17, uh, she read about Anne Jusson. Like she had, like at, at, at that time, she had an opportunity to read the biography of Anne Hudson, uh, Anne Judson, sorry, the, you, you heard of uh, Adoram Judson's wife is Anne Judson. And she became really impressed and she wants to become uh, come a missionary herself. Um, around the same time, she met a guy, uh, sometimes that's a, uh, yeah, his, his name is Jehu Lewis Chuck. Uh, he was studying as a seminary student in the Baptist Theological Seminary and he proposed to her. And then even when, they, when he proposed to her, they already knew that they want to go together because they share so much interest together. They want to do missions together. Um, and he had a good classmate uh, named uh, Robert Davenport. Both of them, uh, both couples, uh, got ordained to missionaries, uh, to be missionaries on the same day, and both were married on the same day. Um, they, they went out together. But the interesting thing is, Henrietta was 17 when she was married, and Davenport's wife was only 15. So uh, back in those days, were kind of like, okay. Now, the two couples um, went as uh, Baptist missionaries. And after briefly visiting uh, Burma to see the grave of Anne Hudson, they actually went to Macau. Anyone have been to Macau here? Not a lot, okay, some, okay. So they went to Macau, why? Because in 1836, China was not open yet. So they ministered in Macau for six years um, until 1842, and that was a, at that time, there was a, something called the Opium War fought between the Brits and the, and the, and the Chinese. After that, the, the Chinese lost, and uh, in that, was the t uh, that was why in March 1842, uh, China ceded Hong Kong to Britain. Um, and part because of that, missionaries were allowed to move to Hong Kong. So they moved from Macau over to Hong Kong and then start ministering in Hong Kong. A lot of us, like, you know, some of your parents come from Hong Kong, right? So, but she was the first woman, uh, first wo Western woman, that, let's put it, she was the first Western woman to live in Hong Kong. The first Western woman, uh, woman um, to uh, not only live in Hong Kong, but also to be the founder of the first ghost school in Hong Kong. Upon arrival in Hong Kong, uh, her family decided to uh, focus on education. And uh, she got a grant from the governor of Hong Kong. Uh, his name is Sir Henry Pottinger. Uh, so Sir Henry Pottinger, sometimes that depends on whether you want a more German pronunciation. So Sir Henry, Sir Henry Pottinger uh, not only g gave her um, uh, some land to build a church, she, he also gave her a tax exemption uh, and a subsidy of fifty dollars to build uh, uh, the, the the school, and uh, fifty dollars is a lot of money back those days. 
Um, and um, they uh, built the first Baptist church in, the fir in that British colony um, and initially named the Queen's Row Baptist Church. Uh, uh, if you have been to Hong Kong at all, you probably know where Queen's Row is, Victoria Row. Uh, Queen's Row Baptist Church and later known as Hong Kong Baptist Church. I actually grew up in Hong Kong Baptist Church, that's where it come, came from. Um, and then a year after arriving in Hong Kong, they uh, actually opened a boarding school, uh, initially for 15 boys and girls. Uh, by 1844, they uh, expanded to take 32 uh, students. Um, and also they personally brought a lot of orphans into their homes. Um, now, that like work her hard. So after the birth of her fourth child, Henrietta became ill. Uh, she lost a lot of weight, uh, only down to 85 pounds. Uh, she recovered though, nevertheless. Uh, after giving birth to her fifth child, Henrietta died um, and only at the age of 27. Uh, so she was buried in Hong Kong um, and uh, in a cemetery in uh, Happy Valley. So uh, a lot of her, her story, like you know, Adoniram and Anne Justin, was uh, circulated, again, driving a lot of interest among the expression Baptists to go to do mission work. Um, there is a very famous school in Hong Kong. Uh, I didn't put the picture there. It's called the Henrietta Secondary School uh, in Hong Kong, uh, named that after her. Now, so this is my uh, little, like, you know, uh, Cliff note version of the modern uh, mission history for all of you. I mean, that's the best I can do with like only 35, 40 minutes. But I want to return to the, um, the key three points I mentioned up front is Baptist, women, and education. I, I hope you get that idea. All three played a key role in the modern mission work. Now, the question then is like, how do we respond? Now, you hear a story. Sometimes we read a Bible story, we respond. How do we respond today as we learn about mission history in the last 200, 300 years? Um, I think there are several practical things we could do um, uh, uh, to, to, to respond to uh, the heroic story of the missions, uh, mission work that have been done. Um, I don't have a lot of time to discuss in detail, but the first thing I want to highlight is simply what we try to do here. Uh, learn more about the Law Team Moon Christmas offering. Like you don't go to search Law Team Moon Christmas offering, you hear about what this is about. And uh, if we can make an immediate difference in the kingdom of God by uh, supporting missionaries like Tong Li Li, who couldn't come unfortunately. Um, also, uh, we are doing mission journey kits. Some of you uh, like uh, grew up before that, but like in, over in the kids side, we have mission journey kits. And uh, what, what is mission journey kit? We call it MJK. Basically, it is a program we meet in the second hour nowadays, 11, like second, fourth sun, uh, Sunday, and Renee, uh, Renee Hankin and my wife Irene were kind of driving that. We want to teach young kids about mission work, even very early on, by uh, teaching them about the different geography and culture of the world, so that they are not just like know about you know San Jose, but know about the world, know about different countries, know about different cultures. And then through art and craft, they do a lot of art and craft over there to kind of keep them interested. So like if you're interested to help out, I, I'm sure like there's some way for the, for the youth to help out with MJK uh, at some point. The other thing I can think of is like we have been doing it like short term mission. So as a youth, you learn more about all the missionaries. I think it will give you drive to do short term mission yourself. So don't just go, learn about missionaries before you go, like hear about their uh, heroic stories, get inspired, and then you have energy and you have excitement when you go to short-term missions. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, uh, giving us an opportunity to serve you. We know that is a privilege because we know that a lot of people, they live and even die in darkness. So we thank you for the opportunity to not only know you, but to make you known. And I pray that w as we know about um, mission work, we can be motivated. So help us like find time to, um, uh, in addition to the most important thing of studying your word, uh, your word in the Bible, also find time to learn about the great mission works that our predecessors have done so that we may be inspired, we may be encouraged. Even when we are discouraged, we see that you allow them to come through. Um, 
help us have a sense of history. In Jesus' name, amen.